The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Journeys into American History. A restless white youth raised by Indians, Natty Bumpo is called Deerslayer for the daring that sets him apart from his peers. But he has yet to meet the test of human conflict. In a tale of violent action and superbly sustained suspense, the harsh realities of tribal warfare force him to kill his first foe, then face torture at the stake. Still yet another kind of initiation awaits him when he discovers not only the ruthlessness of civilized men, but also the special danger of a woman's will. His reckless spirit transformed into mature courage and moral certainty, the Deerslayer emerges to face life with nobility as pure and proud as the wilderness whose fierce beauty and freedom have claimed his heart. You are about to hear another episode of The Deerslayer, dramatized and directed by Charles Frederick Lindsley. Deerslayer has negotiated for the ransom of the two white men held prisoners by the Iroquois. He has shown the chief, Rivenoak, the curious little ivory elephants, the beasts with two tails, and demanded the return of Tom Hutter and Harry March for their exchange. Rivenoak parleys with the woodsman and finally refuses the offer. As the Iroquois push off in their raft, Judith, who is watching them through the spyglass, cries out a warning. Be on your guard, Deerslayer! I can see rifles beneath the hemlock brush, and the Iroquois loosening them with the feet. I see what you're doing, Mingo. Make another move for them rifles, and you're a dead engine. Iroquois, no got rifles. You lie. I can see them with this spyglass. Oh, why should Rivenoak and White Brother leave cloud between them? They both wise and brave. We part like friends. One beast, price, or one prisoner. I thought you'd come to your senses. And now, Mingo, you'll see that a pale face knows how to be generous. Bring us our friends and you can have three ivory beasts. And if you come afore sunset, you may have a fourth. A pale face? He give four animal with two tail if white captive men come before sunset? Yes, four. A river no, chief of Iroquois. He go, captive, come. Dear Slayer, can any face be put in these wretches? Won't they keep the toy elephant they have and send us instead some bloody proof of their cunning? No doubt, Judith. If it wasn't for Indian nature, but that two-tailed beast will turn the whole tribe into a hornet's nest of curiosity. There'll be no peace between them until they get every carved bone they can from us. Well, all we can do now is to wait and see what they will do. Why they've been so long in coming? It's almost dark now. Do you suppose they've intentionally waited until this time so they can attack us? No, they'll not attack, I'm sure. They know the danger in that. I think they probably had Hurry and your father at the camp removed from the pint where they embarked and had to wait until some of the band could fetch him. Must not make Iroquois angry. Be friendly, dear Slayer. Well, that's a new note from you, Chingakook. What's your reason in that? Make Iroquois angry? They take women away from camp. Oh, I see. Some more cunning, a big serpent. Uh, he's afraid, Judith, that the engines will remove the women and children and take Wata Wa along. Now, I guess you're right, Chief. Rather than have the bargain fall through now, I'll throw in three or four war trinkets to please their fancy. We must keep them calm and trustful until we can get your gal away from them. I believe I see them now, dear Slayer. It's getting dark, but maybe you can tell who's on the raft. Why, oh, you're right, gal. They've slipped up on us almost while we've been talking about them. Here, let me see. Can you see Father and Harry? Yes. Your father and Harry are on board, all right. All trussed up like animals. Listen. Ahoy, Judith! Here, Slayer! It's Father. It's 
It's all right, old Tom. Tell the Mingos to keep the distance. We'll make our bargain from here. Chinkagook, go inside and hide all the firearms. I know Hurry Harry, and he'll break faith with the enemy as soon as he lands. If he can lay hand to a rifle. Are you armed, Iroquois? Oh, pale face, brother, no. Ribbon will put faith in him. No got gun on rat. All right. Draw up and put your prisoners on this platform. But we have you covered in one false move, and you'll never see your tribe again. Judith here will hand you the little beast when you help old Tom and his friend up on the castle. Here, Judith. Take these elephants and pass them over when the prisoners come up on the platform with us. The other Iroquois cutting the ropes off their feet now and helping them up. Uh, they've been trussed up so tight they can hardly stand. Hello there, Harry. <laughs> you look like a girdled pine in the clearing. I'm glad to see that you haven't had your hair dressed by any Iroquois barbers. Okay, dear Slayer. It'll be prudent for you to deal less in mirth and more in friendship. Give us a hand. Act like a Christian for once and not like a laughing schoolgirl. We'll take the master of the castle first. Up with you, Hunter. Here, let me cut these bonds off your hands. You've come off whole, feet and all. You're just a little numb from being tied up so tight, that's all. Here, dance around a bit, and nature will soon set the blood in motion. Have you delivered the elephants, Judith? Yes, River Oak has them all. Good. Come on, Harry, you're next. Welcome to Muskrat Castle. And I'll perform the same service for you. There. Give me that rifle. Hurry! I'll teach them bloody farmers they can't treat Hurry Harry this way. Stop that rifle, Hurry. Are you crazy? You know, Stop it, I say. I tell you, them Indians are treating me in a terrible way. You think I'm going to let them get away with it? Well, Hurry, it's a good thing that you fired straight in the air. If you had killed one of the Mingos on the raft, no ransom in the world could save our scalps. You're a fool to lose control of yourself in such a way. You've come off whole, and that's not little. Knowing that there's four rifles on the castle now, the farmers may decide to leave these parts. Ah, you're a woman, dear Slayer. Grow a beard, and maybe you'll be fit company for real men. That black at Rivenoak has an uncommon scalp, and I'd give as much for it as the colony. A white man's word is worth more than all the scalps in the world, Hurry. And dear Slayer never breaks faith, even with a redskin. Well, it's over now. And sighs and lamentations won't mend the matter. Judith, darling, did you mourn for me much when I was in the hands of the enemy? Our tears have raised the lake, Harry March, as you might have seen by the shore. We grieve for Father, of course. But for you, we fairly rain tears. Yeah. It's a wonderment to me how you got us off, dear Slayer. Let us into the secret. Was it by lying or by coaxing? By neither, Hurdy, but by buying. We paid a ransom for you. But be on your guard again, lest our stock of goods shouldn't hold out. I wonder if it's peace or war betwixt us and the savages. This given up captives has a friendly look. Here's an answer to that question, Master March. Look at that. Why... It's a bundle of sticks tied with a piece of deer skin. Where did it come from? Oh, look, Harry. The ends have been dipped in blood. You're right, Judith. If this isn't plain English, it's plain Indian. This is a declaration of war. How did you get this, Deer Slayer? Where did it come from? We left Chinkakook on the lookout after the Iroquois chief left on his raft. He tells me that the raft had not gone far until it headed toward us again. He was just about to call me when Riven Oak threw this faggot up on the platform of the castle and then rode away. The prowling wolves! Hand me that rifle, Judith. I'll send an answer back to the vagabond. Not while I stand by, Hurry. He'll do no good. Give me a rifle, I say. Yeah, give me a canoe, and I'll overhaul the devils and bring back Riven Oak's scalp. I'll attack their camp if necessary. They fetched me once, but this time the painted reptiles will not catch me up. Dear Slayer, you're untrue to your friend. Shame on you, Harry March. You're a braggart and an ingrate. Let him rant, Jude. The war's not over, Hurry. And you'll have chance enough to express your vengeance. But go into the cabin with Hutter and cool yourself off. You're in no danger tonight. Ah, you're nothing but a screw. You're a well-named young man, Judith. Harry certainly expresses his nature. And that quick temper of his will get him into plenty of trouble before he dies. Oh, dear Slayer, this is a terrible life for women. Would to heaven I could see an end to it. The life is well enough, Judith. What would you wish to see in its place? I should be a thousand times happier to live near us civilized beings, where sleep at night would be sweet and tranquil. A dwelling near the fort would be better than this dreary place. Nay, hey, Judith, I can't agree in the truth of all that. If forts are good to keep off enemies, they sometimes hold enemies of their own. But women are not made for scenes like these, dear Slayer. Scenes of which we shall have no end as long as this wall lasts. If you mean women of white color, you're not far from the truth. But it's different for the women of the red men. Nothing would make Hist happier than to know that Chingakook is prowling around for a scalp. Surely she cannot be a woman and not feel concerned when she knows the man she loves is in danger. She doesn't think of the danger, Judith. 
but of honor. Well, no white girl could feel anything but misery if she believed her betrothed in danger of his life. Nor do I believe that even you could be at peace if you believed your hist in danger. Uh, but I have no hist, nor am I like to have. For I hold it wrong to mix colors except in services. In that you feel as a white man should. Though as for Harry, he would be all the same, whether his wife were a squaw or a governor's daughter, provided she was comely and would help keep his stomach full. Oh, you do march in injustice, Judith. No, Harry's greedy, selfish, and overbearing, ferocious. He's not like you, dear Slayer. You're manly and natural and honest. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Thank you with all my heart. Harry is blunt. Uh, but listen, that's Chingakook. Come in, Chief. Time to meet Watawa. Yes, you're right, Delaware. I was forgetting. Well, I'm ready. We'll take the largest canoe and start for the rendezvous at once. Beasley, how do you propose to rescue the Delaware girl? She's to meet us at the big rock when the big star shows in the north. Well, how can she get away from the Iroquois to meet you as you planned? Don't they hold her captive? Yes, but in the darkness, she may get away long enough to meet us if we're prompt. I don't think it is all likely that she's unobserved. Why? Well, the Iroquois must know that your friend Chingakook is here with us in the castle. Do you think they'll take their eyes off the girl even for a moment? They probably know about the chief here, all right. But since the girl has sent us word, we must not disappoint her if she tries to keep the appointment. Well, suppose she's not at the rock. What'll you do then? We go Mingo camp. Take wa when Mingo sleep. Oh, dear Slayer, do you intend to go into the Mingo camp? If you do not find wa at the rock, why, it's taking your life in your hands. Oh, very likely, gal. Oh, I tell you, this is folly. This bundle of sticks dipped in blood which they sent to the castle means that they'll give no quarter. What can you do against 40 or 50 cruel Indians? You must leave all that to our cunning, Judith. Now we'll find a way to take the girl. And we'll be back here at the castle before daylight. Are you ready, Chief? Canoe ready. We go take war. Maybe three, four, mingo scalp. Uh. Then goodbye, dear uh. Slayer, and good luck. You're going into a death trap. My instinct tells me a great evil awaits you. Be careful, dear Slayer. I will take no more chances than needed, Judith. And we'll be back again the rising of the sun. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> 